is a short video to walk you through the things that you need to do to complete the second tutorial exercise. Uh, so that's due on October 2nd, uh, late in the evening. So what you need to do is you need to go to Tutorials Weekly Content, and there's a number of documents that are there. Um, there's a background video. If you have yet to watch the background video, you should stop and watch the background video. There's really important content, not only for this week, but for the rest of the course, that's in that video. So essential viewing. If you haven't watched it, stop and go watch it right away. Uh, then the next thing I want you to take a look at is I would like you to download um, this lesson plan. I'm just going to click on it, which opens it up um, in D2L, but you should download it. Uh, and here it gives you a step-by-step -step set of instructions on what to do for this particular tutorial. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to open up Stata. You'll see it is empty. It doesn't have a data set in it. The very next thing that you do is you start your log. So you say begin. You'll get prompted to save it. Here you would want to save it with the format of your surname, the course, and the tutorial that you're doing. Just click save. And then you're going to want to open up two other documents. You're going to want to download the data set that you need for this week which is the 2019 Canadian Election Study, the data for Tutorial 2. It's a short, truncated data set, and so I want you to work with this one, not with the full Canadian Election Study. You could conceivably get the assignment done if you were using the full Canadian Election Study, but it would just be so much more difficult than using this one. So just use this one. So you, would, you can download it from D2L this way. So you just click on this and click Download. I already have it downloaded, it's in my download folder, so I'm just going to click on that. And it opens up, and here I've got the list of variables that I need. Okay, the other thing I want you to have readily accessible is in the data set section. And here I want you to have this code book. It's the 2019 Canadian Election Study. It's a really long PDF document. I already have it open up here in my Acrobat. So it's 518 pages. But what you need this for, it tells you a bunch of things about the actual like way they conducted the survey and things. But what it also gives you is the actual question wording for uh, a lot of the questions in English and in French, because the study was run in English and in French. Uh, and so if you're looking, say, at Stata and you've got these labels, the label is usually the question wording, but it's often truncated like so here you can see if we're looking at this for the province this is cps19 um, underscore province uh, the label gets us part of the question it says which province or territory are you and then it just leaves it there uh, and if we were to do a uh, frequency distribution or just like ask the computer to run a table about this uh, here from the table, we can actually get the full question wording. And so this is great. For this particular variable, we now know exactly what this is asking. And it tells us how many people live in Alberta, how many people who are in the study who live in places like Alberta. Um, you can see the poor territories, even though we've got almost 38,000 people, we at least have people from the territories in this. That's, that's better than what it usually is with a smaller sample and things. Um, but like, there's any number of these questions where uh, the question wording isn't going to be completely clear from this part. It might get truncated and cut off. And so the way for you to find the wording for um, one of those question wordings is to, or one of these questions is to actually take the variable name. And if you do a search in, uh, in that document, it will actually direct you to where you can find that question wording. Uh, and so that's where you can get the complete question wording, complete categories, things along those lines. Okay. So for the purposes of the tutorial assignment, the other thing that you need to do is go into assessments, into quizzes, and then you'll want to start the tutorial exercise number two. So for this week, uh, once you have everything set up and ready to go, you'll go into doing that tutorial exercise. And it's a series of multiple choice questions, fill in the blank, um, 
things where we're asking pretty much what's the level of measurement of all of these particular variables. And so there's a couple of ways that you can figure it out. Uh, if you go into this, say the data browser, which is where we were before, you can see any number of clues that would tell you that you've got, um, say nominal data with different categories where you have like just different categorizations that have some kind of number on them. That's it. Uh, you can see that some of these look like they might have a rank order to them, things along those lines. You've got some things that look like numbers. You've these dots that indicate missing data. So whoever this person is, so each one of these rows is a person who answered the study. And anytime there's a blank like this, uh, they haven't actually answered the question. Uh, and so here you can see for the very first person, um, this is the question that's asking them about the, their income, how much they actually made in terms of like actual dollars over the course of a year. And I think most people don't actually have this down to like the actual precise dollar amount. Um, but she's refused to answer this question. And then when they ask a follow up and they say, oh, well, we don't know, need to know exactly what it is. But if you can tell us like ballpark, what category do you fall in? She's choosing to say that she doesn't know there. Uh, yeah. So here you can get some clues, but this is also one of these things where, um, we're not necessarily getting all the information that we need. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight, if you look at these dots, there's for this first bit, these first couple of questions, there's lots of, uh, actual data that's in them. But if we go to all of these ones, at least at the top here that start with PES, we have all of these, like there's lots of missing, um, and we have to go a little bit to actually start to find some people who've answered all of those questions. Why is this the case? Uh, there's a couple of reasons why, and I think the most important one for you to know has to do with what CPS and PES mean. So CPS, in the context of the Canadian election study, means campaign period survey. So CPS means campaign period survey survey. This means that this is just the survey that was done while the election was underway. One of the things that the Canadian election study does when they're doing this part of the survey is that they will interview a certain number of people every day. And that way they are able to do more advanced analyses than what we will do in the context of this class. But that having the data set up that way means that they can actually trace the importance of campaign events. And so if they want to see whether or not the debate mattered, they've got a bunch of people that were surveyed before the debate, and then the debate happens, and then they can, they're surveying a bunch of people after the debate, and they can see how the how public opinion moves or how people react to different party leaders or parties moves in that kind of context. Um, so that's the campaign period surveys. This is all done before election day. But if we get to PES, uh, this means that this is from a different survey. So this is the post-election survey. So PES means post-election survey. And this is really self-explanatory. This is the survey that got administered um, to Canadians after the election was done. What they try to do is they try to re-interview the same people um, so that you actually can trace how individual people were from when you interviewed them during the campaign period survey and when you got them again in the post-election survey. Uh, so it's not quite as much of a, like a really good like time series as what the campaign period stuff can be depending on how you're analyzing it, but it's still like pretty good to be able to look at an individual um, and see see how stable they are over the course of a number of weeks around an election. The other benefit is that means that anybody who gave us demographic information, like their gender, what province they lived in, sexual orientation, education there, um, sexual orientation is in the data set as well, but I'm not using it here. Uh, all, oh no, I am. There it is. There it is. Uh, the, all of those, if they answer it during the campaign period survey, that means that we don't have to ask it again in the post-election survey because it's the same folks. Okay, so campaign period surveys, CPS, post-election survey is PES. Uh, so you could look to see what's going on with uh, these variables and what's being asked and the properties that are being asked in each question by looking at the data browser. Um, you can run a cross tab for any of them. So you could do tab um, and you would just, you could either just type out the name of uh, a variable. So I do tab CPS gender. This is, uh, I'm getting this error message here. 
So I've asked the computer to run a, like one of these little tables of, this is a frequency distribution. It's formal textbook name, but it's like the command is just tab. So I said tab CPS gender, and it says the variable is not found. And when you get a, one of these error messages, you can click on that. And another window will pop up and tell you like, uh, what the problem is. And here it's saying it doesn't exist, um, which is true because I've made a mistake in the name of the, uh, variable that I've wanted to put in. So what it needs to be is tab CPS 19 underscore gender. And there we go. So you can see that we've got three categories here. You've got, um, men and women, and then folks who are not defined by the binary. If you want to look at what the question wording looks like, you just have to, I would do, I would actually just use gender as a keyword, oh, which might get me more than I want because they use gender as a key factor um, uh, in figuring out to make sure if the sample is good. And there's lots of gender things here. boop -a doop boop -a doop big document. Here we are, CPS 19 gender. So if I had just searched for CPS underscore, CPS 19 underscore gender, I would have gotten here right away. But here you can see the question wording in English and in French. And the other thing that the code book tells you too is the numeral that's associated with these categories. So when we get into week three, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting to transform uh, these variables from their raw form like we have them here into a format that we'll start to use for analysis. Uh, and so this is why knowing what these numerals are is really important. Um, so hold that for next week. But here, here what I want you to look at is what can you learn about the variable and the type of variable that it is, the level that it is measured at by looking at the question. So you can get that from the question wording in the code book, you can get that from running a frequency distribution. I want to show you a couple of other things that will happen if you're going to run um, some variables. So here I want to run um, income number. So one of the things, the tricks you should learn is you do tab and then you double click on a variable in your list. It puts it into the command box here. Uh, and so I'm going to run this same table and this is what happens. So first you can see um, what was your total? Like I've got a little bit of the question wording, but it's, it's completely truncated. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it in my search function to see what the question wording is. And so here I know the question wording is asking people in the survey about their total household income before taxes for 2018. I don't know what anybody else, but I would never have this at the top of my mind. And it's not that I don't care about how much money I make. It's that this is not the number that I budget with. Therefore, I would not know. I don't know it. Um, and so what they're also asking is to include in from all sources. So this would be earned income, uh, income from wealth sources, things along those lines. And so here we're talking about total income and we're also talking about total household. So this is every adult in the house is contributing to the household income, right? Uh, and so what they're asking people to do is they want you to round to the nearest thousand. So if you, and they give an example of like what this is here. Uh, and then if they say, if you prefer not to answer, then you click the arrow and that's how you get people to be a little period, like that little dot uh, as missing on that question because they choose not to answer it. So if I'm running this frequency distribution, um, what, and this is what I get. Now I know what this is asking, but it's not showing me everything, right? Like these are people who say that they earned nothing, zero dollars, um, one dollar, 15 bucks. Like this clearly is not the whole picture. And you can totally see here too, that I've got this spinning thing down at the bottom. So say does waiting for me to click on the more and the more and the more and the more. Other ways that you can do this is this more button up here. I don't know if the PC version has it, but like it might have a version of that. Other ways you can do it is if you go into the command box and just hit the space bar, it'll do it as well. But this takes forever. So how do we do this in a different way? I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna click break so that this ends. Uh, and there's this command called set more off. I'm gonna run that. Now I'm gonna do tab income number again, and it just runs the whole thing. So one of the easiest ways to do this is actually in a do file. So if you've got a do file, 
I want you to get into the habit of making these nice and clean right from the outset. So the first thing I'm going to do, because usually when you're running a do file is that you want to be able to come back to use it again. So I'm going to grab the file name for the file that I'm using. Um, I'm going to clean this up so it sits on a single line. You can see it just changed color there. So it went from not the right color to the right color. So this turned burgundy. Um, when that part was correct. And then I'm just going to do comma clear on that. So what this is saying to the computer is use this data set and clear out whatever you had had before. This is good best practice to use. Um, here I would want to do, if I just did tab, the same sort of thing, if I did tab, uh, I'm just going to double click this and that gets it there. So I'm just going to do tab that. And if I just make it run. Oh, the set more off is already on. Anyway, if you wanted to do it, uh, if I reopen the data set, there we go. And then I wanted to get it. Mm. Okay. Anyway, the computer is, I want it to show like I'm making a mistake, but it's not doing it. Anyway, if you wanted to put this into your do file, you could just type in set more off and then you could set it up to run any number of, uh, any number of variables. So let's say I wanted to run a frequency distribution of all of them. I'm going to select them all, double click. I want all of them like this in the command area. I'm going to grab all of them and I'm going to put them in my do file. So what happens if I do tab the entire list? Is this going to work? Here, I'm going to clear that out of here too. Hold on one minute. I do tab the entire list and they say, oh, too many variables specified. This is the computer telling me that I'm trying to do too much at once. And it thinks that I want to make a table with every single variable in it, which is actually not what I want to do. You can click on this area and it says this command doesn't allow for as many variables as you specified or as many variables as you told it to run. Um, for example, this one takes only one or two variables. So how do I make it run everything separately? You do tab one. So this is kind of like saying it, tap them one at a time. Oopsies. And when you run that, it literally just gave me a frequency of absolutely everything that's in that data set, um, which is sometimes useful, sometimes not, depending on what you need to do. Let's see, here we are. And now I need to find gender <laughs> in here. Why is province, oh. Gender somehow got dropped off of that one. Anyway, so here you can see, um, this is where the log will tell me that I ran a command from my do file. So that's the do. This is what the command looks like. And now it just has the tables for province or territory. So uh, somehow gender got left off there. But so you can see the second variable. Then there's education. You can see the complete wording there, all the categories. This one, it looks a little bit garbled, but it's on the whole how satisfied are you with the way that democracy works in Canada? You see all these categories. Um, this is political interest. I talked about that in the background video. And this is how interested are you in politics generally? Set the slider number from zero, and it's not telling me uh, what that zero means. So this might be one of the ones that I will look up here. No. Oh. Interesting. interest in politics. Okay. Here, you can see that this is pretty similar. This is telling me it's from the post-election survey, but I think the wording is odds are really good that it's going to be the same. So it's saying, how interested are you in politics generally, which is a match here. Uh, and here it's like, use the scale from zero to 10, but it, here it's saying, set the slider to a number from zero to 10. And this is the key part where zero means no interest at all, and 10 means a great deal of interest. So if you remember from the background video, sometimes we really care about what zero means. And actually, if we're going to distinguish between interval level data and racial level data, we really care about what that zero means. And so here the codebook is telling me the information that I need, where zero means no interest at all. So it tells me it's the absence of interest in politics. Um, and if you look at the distribution here, uh, it's interesting who would choose the extreme 
uh, options. I always find that interesting here, but far fewer people are saying they have zero interest in politics and all compared to a great deal of interest. Uh, but still, yeah, that's where that is. Uh, and then you've got, uh, here's sexual orientation. Here's that income one that we've looked at. This is very long. Yeah, it's very long. Goodness. Okay. Then you've got things like income categories. If you're going to be working with income, uh, yeah, somehow we need to get this one and this one together. And so stay tuned for next week because that's some of the stuff that we're going to be doing. But here we can see some categories. A big thing to look at is to see whether or not the gaps between these categories or the amount of money captured by each one of these categories is the same. Because if it is, that has different implications than if it isn't. Okay. And then you've got some other questions as well. Now, one of the things I want to highlight is that in any number of these questions, you have this like, don't know, prefer not to answer option. Uh, and it shows up, it doesn't show up all the time, but it does show up quite a lot. Oh, and I can't get all the way up to the top here, but let me just run this education variable as a moment. Okay. So here we're looking at like all the different like categories that people could put themselves in for education. And you can see that there's like a pretty clear order in terms of like more or less education, right? So there's less like all starting with like none, uh, all the way up to a professional degree. So that would be like uh, a law degree or um, a physician, like a medical degree, a medical doctorate, things along those lines. So a PhD thing. And then there's this don't know, prefer not to answer. So if we're trying to figure out the level of measurement, what do we do with these don't knows? Are these people who say that they don't want to answer the question? We have to capture them because uh, we'll often use that to like diagnose whether or not a question is very good. If we've got a bunch of people who are like, I am not answering your question, that tells us that we probably have some issues with the question. But for your purposes, trying to figure out what does this do to like, sh how do I consider this in terms of a level of measurement question? The answer is that you don't. So these don't knows, these prefers not to answer people who like didn't know how to answer the question. So they didn't give you an answer, uh, or the people who refused to answer the question. So they didn't give you an answer. All this is doing is counting people who didn't give you an answer. And so it's a category that we need to put people in because some people will refuse to give us an answer or they just don't give us an answer, but it's not substantive. Like it doesn't actually capture the thing that we're measuring. And so to figure out the level of analysis, you need to look at these categories. These are the substantive categories, the categories that in this case about like where it is your level of education land. Right? Um, so this is the set of considerations that you'll use to figure out what a level of measurement is for any given variable and you would ignore this next week when we start working with variables you can't ignore these you have to do something special with them but for the purposes of determining level of measurement you ignore them you determine the level of measurement from these substantive categories these categories where somebody actually gave us an answer to the question that we were asking and so people who Tells, tell us, I don't know how to answer that question. They're not really answering the question. People who say, I'm not going to answer that question are not answering the question. So this category, they're just non-answers. We determine the level of measurement based on the substantive actual answers that we get for the thing that we're measuring here. Okay. So that should give you some skills to be able to figure out where you can get all the information that you need to answer those questions on D2L. Once you're done with that, you just want to stop your log and you just say close and that closes your log and it's already saved because you saved it when you start. Uh, so I'm going to uh, close that file. I'm just going to close all of those tabs. I don't know what I've got in there, but it's Friday. so. <laughs> <laughs> here I'm going to save my do file. So I'm going to click save do file and I'll just do again the same format Thomas Polly 399. So your surname tutorial number two. Oop, I probably spelled tutorial wrong, didn't I? It works to save. Hmm. 
Normally that doesn't take so long. Anyway, if you used it, you should save it and then upload it to the Dropbox on D2L. Uh, and the other thing that you should do to upload into the Dropbox is always put that log file in. So wherever you saved those files, you're gonna want to go to the Dropbox um, and then just for tutorials, just put them into the same thing. I'll be able to look at the ones that I need to uh, by the date that they go in. And so uh, you'll have your Dropbox for tutorials and you will just keep putting tutorial stuff in there. Uh, and of course, you'll need to make sure that you get that quiz done um, here. What you'll end up doing is you'll end up bouncing back and forth between the quiz and Stata, um, just to make sure that for each step, you're getting the information that you need for each question. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how that goes. All right, good luck. And uh, next week after this is when things get super interesting with Stata. So stay tuned for that.